UK. So I think the numbers are quite constant. Okay, so welcome everyone to our next online talk. And today we will discuss um, rapid tests for COVID using cough recording. Um, you're very encouraged to send a question, so please do so by sending a question to the Slido by using our event code. You can also find it in the chat, you can, you can just copy it into the website. If you want to contact us later, you can send us an email and also subscribe at our website. And we're very excited to announce that we have a competition starting tomorrow, so please register so you can get more details. This competition is to share your research in pharmacology and drug discovery. You will be uh, asked to prepare a one minute presentation on uh, Zoom, so you can record yourself for one minute with a slide or, or two about your uh, research. And then you can send it to us before the 15th of July. A panel of researchers will judge the best presentation, so there will be a prize. So this is a great occasion to uh, add something to your CV, uh, take part, um, and also share your impact of your research. And we would just like to thank our sponsors for our society and also uh, thank all the society that collaborated with us today. For this special occasion, they uh, advertised this event to all their members, not only from Oxford, but Cambridge, Glasgow, and Sheffield and London. So thank you to, to everyone. And now it's my pleasure to introduce Emmy. Emmy is a computer neuro computational neuroscientist uh, trained in Oxford. Is the CEO and co-founder of Novoik. Novoik is a digital biotechnology company that is using uh, deep audio natural language processing to diagnose the way we um, like the, uh, the way we think, basically our um, sorry neurological um, patterns. And now they are translating this technique for respiratory diseases. So it's a very interesting topic. And thank you, Emil, for being with us today. So I'll pass over to you. Thanks a lot for the introduction and for the Pharmacology Society for organizing this event and all the other societies that have contributed in making such a crowd happen on such a short notice. I am very excited to be here today representing not only the public, but more importantly, our amazing volunteer community, which is soon 100 people who's helping with the Donate a Cough campaign. I, I want to kick off this presentation by, um, by asking a question. Um, on, on the slide is shown three different sentences. And one of them is from someone with Alzheimer's disease. I want you to have a read through and make a guess as to which one it is. And the way we'll do this in terms of pooling is you just write your answer in the chat once you, you have it ready and we'll do some rough, rough counting. You can find the chat in the bottom of the, of the Zoom. Amazing answers are coming in now. We have a clear front runner. You have another, another 20, 25 seconds. Okay. 10 seconds left. Okay, and we'll wrap it up there. Thanks for everyone who sent in the, um, the answers. Doing a rough count, number three is up by, I say, 60%, number one with about 30 something percent, and then we have a couple number two and one number four. Uh, thank you, Anna. Um, okay, the right answer here is actually number two. Um, and, and it's something that we, we've run in a lot of different fora, and, if you do this enough time, it comes out almost as a random distribution. Now, similarly, I wanted to, um, to just show two different audio traces. One of these is from someone with Parkinson's, the other one is from a control. And this time, I, I won't even, even bother with the, with the full, because it also comes out pretty much at random. Now, it turns out that there's changes in both the words you say and the way you say them when the brain and the respiratory system gets affected by a disease. And not only do you see these changes um, in, in many different conditions, they actually appear some of the earliest signs of disease in, um, in, in many of them. 
what we do in Novoic is we use um, algorithms, we use deep learning, um, audio and language-based algorithms to analyze uh, audio linguistic patterns of speech to detect disease. Now, if you think about what goes into the process of producing, um, of producing speech, it starts all with having a concept in memory, something that you want to articulate, formulate. It then has to be um, to be processed, turned into, um, into language, so sentences, words, composing both of semantics, grammar, and syntax. Uh, and, and these two together sort of constitutes the, um, the language of what it is that you're saying. To actually speak it, you need to turn it into, into well, voice. And what you do there is first um, formulating the syllables, the phonemes that you want to use. So, so what are the, the building blocks of, um, of, um, of, 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 of the voice that you want to convey? And then you have to get your vocal cord, your articulators, your lungs in the proper position to actually speak the words that you, you wanted to convey. This requires coding the timing um, of both articulators and the vocal folds um, as, you, as, as you work with uh, neural signaling and, and muscle and activation. Now, the really interesting part here is that there's different areas of the brain and the vocal cord and the respiratory system that are involved at each step of this process. And when different diseases and conditions affect um, either different brain areas, different parts of the spiritual system, you get effects on the, um, on the speech that are also unique to different conditions. These generally fall in, um, in different classes along this hierarchy of using speech going from cognitive diseases such as Alzheimer's disease, Ruberg dementia, um, where it's mostly the language that matters to diseases where it becomes increasing the prosodic and sort of acoustic information that matters. And this is the case for affective disorders such as depression, bipolar, PTSD. And further down, we have motor disorders where you can have degradation of either the nervous innervation or of the muscles in the vocal cord that you can read out on an audio phase in, for instance, Parkinson's. Um, and finally, what, what produces all of the, of, of the speech we're speaking right now is getting um, air from the lungs pushed through the um, the, the vocal cavities that you have on, uh, on the way. And here you see particular changes in respiratory disorders. Now, we started out as a company in, uh, in, in, uh, in neurology. We've done most of our work in, in these three different, different groups. Uh, but when we saw the, the global impact of the problem, we decided to see what we could do with what we do best and turn an increasing effort towards um, respiratory disorders. Um, of course, the most prominent ones of those being COVID, which I'll I'll get back to a bit later in the, in the presentation. Um, you can help, you can get involved. Um, we are um, we're extremely excited to be working with the, the volunteer team um, closely that, that we have. Um, and we'd love for you to, um, to be involved if you are in any um, capacity interested. Um, I hope that everyone on this call will um, be able to do the, the small ask, which is, um, Write and um, sort of stalk down some of your friends on Facebook um, or, 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 um, or, or whatever, convince them to donate a cough and also assign them to do the same, um, the same task of getting to know their friends, then get to know, to know their friends. Um, if you're interested in coming more closely involved, there's also an opportunity to join the volunteer team. And you can send me a message or you can, you can write outreach at donateyourcough.com. And I think the organizers of the event can also help facilitate and connection if you're interested. We, we'd be super excited to have you part of the community. Um, very briefly about, about me, because the segment into into the founding story of Novoic. Um, I'm an Oxford-trained computational neuroscientist that did my research in um, at Oxford, building out neural network models of the human sensory system, seeing what inspiration we can take from biology to inform how we do information processing in artificial systems. And while at Oxford and, and, and sort of prior, I've been, I've been quite heavily involved in the entrepreneurial communities there, uh, including uh, the Skull Center, Science Innovation Union in, in Oxford, also the, uh, the Elevate Accelerator, um, um, and, and more recently, Entrepreneur First in, in London. So if you do have questions around um, the, um, the ecosystem or the communities in Oxford or in London, if you're interested in, in what it's like to find a community from scratch, I'm also very happy to take questions on that. But for me, the founding story of Mavoic really goes back a long time. Um, I had from a young age a personal connection to, to the disease, um, um, I'm sorry, a personal connection to, to Alzheimer's disease uh, as something that, that was in my family and I saw firsthand how it impacts not only the person who has involved with their spouse and, and the rest of the family. 
Uh, and, and I think it's something that most people in this um, in this room can probably um, can probably recognize either in, in their own family or, or, or with your friend um, who suffered from some some sort of, of condition like this. Um, so it felt quite natural for me to to um, to go into neuroscience research as I as I went to to university, uh, specifically in in Alzheimer's. And you really don't have to be there for a long time before you realize that there's a lot of problems with how you're developing therapies today in not only Alzheimer's, but many of these different, um, different conditions. So we have something called Elam's law, which is just Morse law spelled backwards. Um, what it means is that the cost of getting a new therapy to the market goes down um, over time and actually goes down exponentially. It's particularly bad in neurology, where, for instance, in Alzheimer's, we have a failure rate of just about 100% in in um, getting a drug out now with a record of more than 15 failed phase three trials in a row for Alzheimer's. Um, and and when we, we, we know one of the problems. Uh, one of the big problems is that we can't identify these conditions early enough at a stage where interventions would actually be, be helpful. This got me thinking a lot about how we can, um, we can get uh, design better tools to, to just, um, just the situation. Um, I, I want to tell you a story. Um, it's, about, it's about nuns. Um, so there was a um, there was a monastery in um, back in the in the nineties nineties twenties where um, unmarried women would uh, would come um, to seek seek God and they would get enrolled in the in the monastery at a very young age so typically in their in the twenties um, and what they did when they enrolled was they had to write down a, a short um, short note like the one you see here on, on the picture describing briefly where they were from how they were um, brought up and why they decided to join the monastery. And that was then filed, um, filed in, the, in the monastery archive. And they then went on to live their life in the monastery. Now, the really interesting thing about this particular group of nuns were that they were enrolled into a study in Alzheimer's disease. So they, they, they agreed that uh, once they pass away, they would donate their brains to Alzheimer's research. And so they lived on for another 40 years, 50 years, you know, until they eventually passed away. Now, what happened when the researchers got on site to investigate, um, to, to do autopsies on the brains and, and, and conduct the research, were that they stumbled on this old archive of autobiographical recordings. What they did with those were they gave them to a group of linguists saying, hey, here, here, here's, here's these writings, what can you do with them? And it turned out that from analyzing the language that they wrote when they entered the monasteries in the, in the 20s, they were able to predict who would go on to develop Alzheimer's 40 to 50 years later. This is quite, quite remarkable, but it's actually not only in Alzheimer's disease. It turns out that these changes happen in many different conditions. And for, for a lot of these, um, they happen as one of the, the earliest signs. So I'm listing here on the slides just some of the conditions that we know um, are um, are affecting the, the, the speech process, or either the vocal or, or the linguistic and um, linguistic aspect. Um, so, so I was finding myself in in, in um, sort of in, in the field of, of Alzheimer's research, and, and, and that, that's about the time when I moved to um, to Oxford, and not too dissimilar from a monastery in terms of um, surroundings, um, and and got to work with some, some really really brilliant talented people in the computational neuroscience um, field. Um, coming out of, of that experience, I, um, I sort of had, had, a, had a good heart in the back and, and decided that, um, that it was time to, to, um, to, pursue, to pursue this, this, um, this idea of using, uh, using speech-based markers for creating disease. Um, and that's, that's when I set up um, set up Novoic. I was lucky enough to meet my, uh, my brilliant, um, fantastic co-founder, Jack Weston, who comes out of Cambridge. And we founded the company in the early 2019 and uh, been growing pretty fast since then. We've gone through a lot of things in, in, um, in the last couple of years. We've been through Entrepreneur First in London, Elevate in Oxford, which has both been tremendous places to be. Um, and our, and our um, generally been, been on, a, on a growth trajectory, currently hiring for uh, seven different roles. And if you think what you do is interesting, do go have a, have a, have a look. Um, now, we, we're working in uh, multiple different conditions, both in, in cognition, in motor and affective disorders, now also in spiritual conditions. Um, okay, so I'll, I'll take a, um, 
a bit of a step back and just talk a bit about why um, why we know that these changes occur in different uh, different diseases. Um, so I'm going to give examples first for Alzheimer's, then Parkinson's, and then segue into a number of different spiritual conditions. Um, so, so some of the of the really interesting papers that's been in the in the Alzheimer's field are listed on um, on this slide. Um, some of the areas where we know that there's changes in, um, in, in speech, is particularly in language and semantics, as, as is listed down, down here, so it's the semantic processing, vocabularies, and so on. Uh, one of our clinical advisors, Professor Peter Garrett, um, ran a study, so this is his postdoc um, Ahmed, uh, in Ahmed in 2013, where they looked at a, um, a very longitudinal cohort of um, people who've been following for many, many years in and actually out of Oxford of the optimal cohort. And they then compared as people um, age over time and they progress in developing diseases such as Alzheimer's, what happens with their speech. Um, and the, the different labels that are here on the on the x-axis are comparing um, moderate Alzheimer's with mild Alzheimer's and finally with, um, with, with what's called mild cognitive impairment, which is the pre-stage of having Alzheimer's. And you see a very strong uh, so linear decline in, um, in semantic content in these different, different cohorts, as well as some other linguistic measures and um, syntax are quite, um, quite effective. But we, the hard question is, how do, you, how do you assess the language of someone and then figure out if they get a disease in 40 years, right? You sort of have to have something like the lungs where you can look backwards and, and, and look in the... And sort of, sort of, sort of use time in, in, in that capacity. And so, so Professor Garrett also did a study looking at the, at the writings of a famous author from the UK called Iris Murdoch. Quite an interesting study, although anecdotal. Um, what's interesting about Iris Murdoch is she, lay, she developed Alzheimer's late in life, but she'd been writing throughout most of her life and generally in unedited form. And what they did was they compared the diversity of words to the total number of words that were used in these novels. And they found as as she got older and she progressed through different novels she had written, we saw a decline in, um, in this content. There's also been studies in purely what's called preclinical Alzheimer's. So this is even for the MCI stage. Imagine you go back even further where there's no even cognitive symptoms at all. Um, just looking at genetically at-risk people with Alzheimer's. And these studies have found changes in semantic units, so again, semantic content, and also the way that they, um, they describe situations. And, and I'll get back to that. Um, in Parkinson's, there's, uh, there's clear changes. They're, they're, um, they're early as well. Uh, qualitatively, this is reduced voice volume, so you speak more quietly, and, and the voice will have a quality of being like breathy, be hoarse. You have what's called dysphonia, which is um, which is bad quality of, of um, it's sort of bad vocal quality. Now, quantitatively, the things that you're actually extracting are um, if you want to, to quantify these things on, on, on the left, are things which is listed on the, on the right hand side. Um, so popular um, approaches are jitter and what's called shimmer. And these essentially track the, um, the variation or the, um, yeah, the variance of the frequency and the amplitude at a micro scale in an, in an audio trace. Um, and, and this is out here for PD, that's Parkinson's disease, how each of these features change. So for instance, jitter, you see, and, and um, let's see. But this is for shimmer variants you see an, an, an increase in, um, in Parkinson's patients. Now, there's been studies like this done in people with what's called prodromal Parkinson's before you even get the disease, specifically a, a group of, of people called REM behavior sleep disorder patients. So there's this group of, of individuals who have a particular sleep disorder that is very likely to convert into Parkinson's patients. And they're so likely that it's on the order of, if you have REM behavior sleep disorder, you have 65% chance of getting Parkinson's in seven years. And in this, this cohort of, uh, of um, RPD um, patients, these similar type of speech changes have also been, have been observed and tracked um, sort of as, as they develop Parkinson's. Okay, what do we actually look at? How, 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 do, you, how do you do this? Um, if you look through these different stages of the speech production process, there is um, there's two different um, inputs that we can use for analyzing and feeding these into different different models. They're in general the audio and they're the, the language and the linguistics, uh, which you get from just transcribing the, the audio 
Uh, and these, again, roughly correlates in importance with these different hierarchies of um, disease. I'm, I'm going to take a, um, a short segue and, um, and just discuss briefly um, some of the, of, of, of the technical background at a high level so that, um, that everyone on the call can, can, can be at, at, at a more aligned level as, as we go forward with some of the, of the other papers. Um, apologies to, to, to the people with the CS or, or um, um, auditory neuroscience background um, if, I'm, if I'm butchering this, but, but I want to make sure that everyone are, um, are at a um, so reasonable, reasonable up to date. Um, this male sign used to be a surfboard, um, which would come apparent why that was the case. I'm unsure why it's changed, but, but you, you um, have to excuse them. Okay, so we break this down into audio and, and language. Um, for, for, um, for audio, there's three different ways we can think about feeding audio into, uh, into statistical models and neural network models. We can either just feed the raw audio in um, and have different ways of, of um, sort of, um, of, of doing, doing that process. But what's very often done is you process the audio in a way so it becomes lower dimensional. And one of the reasons that you want to do that is that if you have very high dimensional data, then you need more data for, for these, uh, these networks and these models to not be confused when you begin to, to train them. And there's two common approaches to this. The first one is to get what's, what's called a feature vector. Um, so these are just taking some of these measures we can get out of audio and then putting them into a vector. So imagine that you have these different features that's been shown here and you feed them all into a vector, then you have something that you can put into a model. The other thing that's quite often done is to do some transformation of the audio that turns it into a spectrogram of, the, of, of different, different sorts. And the most common spectrogram to use for, um, for disease prediction based on audio is, um, is the middle frequency um, uh, septal coefficient um, transformation, um, which is a, a, it's a series of transformation of audio that highlights in particular the information that is in speech as opposed to other parts of the, the audio. And it was developed for doing different types of, um, of speaker um, diversation or transcription tasks that, that worked on, on speech. And, and they've also turned out to be very useful for doing these type disease predictions. Um, as for linguistics, um, what you have to do is you have to turn the words into numbers in, 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 in some way. Uh, there's two common approaches. Either you, uh, you can make a vector, so this could be with what's the rate of nouns, what's the frequency of, um, of, of, of words, um, how many sentences are you using, and then you feed that in like you do here with the feature vector. Or otherwise, you can, you can, um, you can what's called um, embed the, the words in different ways so that you turn them into numbers. So for instance, here, you, the word it becomes 8219, happen from 6540, and so on. Um, so you have a vector for each individual word that's encoding or embedding that particular word. And then you have something that's numbers that you can feed into these models. Um, okay, I'm going to take a um, sort of 60 second crash course in, in machine learning, just so we can understand some of the figures on the, on, on the, on the next, next couple of slides. Um, I hope you're all familiar with this type of drawing of a neural network. Uh, you have different inputs, which are numbers that goes into neurons. What the neurons do is essentially just a mathematical oper operation that can be arbitrarily simple or complex, but based on applying those operations to the numbers, you get an output. Now the operations involve parameters, which are things that can be changed. Um, and depending on, on what the parameters are, you get a different output. And the whole idea about these neural networks are then um, figuring out in a clever way how to change the parameters to get the output to be what you want it to be. And that's what's called training a neural network. Now for, um, for, for simplifying, um, we'll just draw out these neurons as, um, as one box here, F, and then you see here we have a bunch of different inputs. So these could be, um, for instance, the different, um, the different rows here in the spectrogram that you want to feed in one at a time as a, as a vector of, um, of number values. Um, okay, I want to talk a bit about what, what convolutions mean. Um, so, so you might have heard convolutional neural networks. What these essentially do is they deploy two different, um, two different types of operations that are a bit more uh, involved and then just the, the orange ones here. Um, they do convolutions and they do max pooling generally. 
what the convolutions do is that they um, they take an, an aggregate measure over several different pieces of the input. It's a way of capturing local information and looking for what type of features are appearing locally as you go out doing the, um, doing the input. So here you might be particularly interested in are there, are there local characteristics here, here, and here, right, with what there appears to be the um, uh, BHC signal, and maybe not that much what's happening in, in the other places. Um, and so, so that, that's generally what, what, these, uh, what these A boxes are doing. They're capturing local information. Now, there's a second commonly applied thing, which is called a max pooling layer. What these do is they, they look in the input and see, OK, is there one value in the input that I'm getting that's above a certain threshold? Like, what's the biggest value that I'm getting? And what these are conceptually doing is that they are they're seeing, is the thing I'm looking for somewhere in the input here, x0, 1, 2, uh, rather than where is it or what does x1, um, 0, 1, 2 look like in, in, in aggregate. And it's a way of zooming out and just seeing is the particular thing I'm looking for there. And then, of course, you can build with an extra layer of, of the same type of units A, and you can do more pooling, but we'll, we'll move it back to that. This doesn't have to be two dimensional, so this can be, um, can be multi dimensional. Um, and it's generally drawn out these individual layers as, as squares in the network. Okay, um, final thing are recurrent neural networks. Um, if you imagine this is the box F, then you have an input that goes in, you have an output. Now, what's different about recurrent neural networks is that they also give input to themselves at the next thing they're going to see. So if X0 comes in, it's fit in, you have H0 coming out, then X1 comes in, and this time around, A is receiving both X1, but also the input from A when it saw X, X0. Uh, if you think about just unrolling, unrolling this, you get a sequence of, of these operations being applied, which is really a way of dealing with data that has a time component to it, which is very useful for analyzing audio, analyzing um, text data. And all these illustrations, by the way, are from, um, from Chris Ola's really, really great blog. You should definitely check it out if you have an, have an interest. Um, okay, I, I want to take a um, another sort of um, pause here in the presentation and do an interactive exercise. Uh, I hope you are all in the, in the chat. What we're going to do is in 60 seconds, I want you all to write down in as much detail as you can what you see on the, um, on the picture here. And we will, uh, we will pick a winner at some time later in either today or, 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 or follow up. Follow. Um, but do write in the chat 60 seconds, as much as you can, details on, on this picture. And we start now. All right, 30 seconds left. And five seconds less. Have to get the submissions in. Here we go. Three, two, one. Amazing. Thank you everyone for, for playing along. You've just been part in a cognitive assessment. 
And this is one of the most common tasks that's being used to evaluate different aspects of cognition and language for, for people with a variety of different diseases, including Alzheimer's. And I'm going to show you a couple of, of, of papers that are actually done that on this particular, uh, particular task. So this is one using this feature-based approach, which was the top one I showed you on, on the prior slide, looking at language. They extracted syntactic features, so different sentence classes, um, analyzed the dependency tree, um, they looked at lexical features, so they counted the words, uh, what type of sentences were being used, functional words, and so on. And then they used what's called engrams, which are just ways of chopping up the language into smaller pieces. So bigrams have two words, trigrams have three different words. We then saw, okay, we take all of those different features and fit them into a, a, a statistical classifier. I think this was a so victim machine um, that, um, and then, then they saw how, how well they did on actually classifying Alzheimer's versus healthy health controls. Um, you see, if you only use syntactical and lexical uh, information here, you actually do pretty well. So you get an error on the curve, which is a measure of um, how good the classifier is performing um, of point, um, point 0.80. So this number goes between 0 and 1. But we see if you use the, the n-grams here, they get an even better performance of 0.991, and you get a slight increase if you are, um, if you are combining, um, combining these two different approaches. But this is all quite... It's quite manual, right? You have to extract the features and find the features. Um, there has been, um, been a lot of work um, with building on that, looking at what's called feature-free approaches. But this is leveraging the other approach we talked about where you have an encoding of the language that you then feed into these different types of networks. So here you see an example of this, this matrix where you have the words embedded and they're then fed through convolutions and max coolings, uh, which you, you all know what, what is now hopefully. Um, finally goes through a recurrent neural network before the network has to decide whether it thinks it's someone with Alzheimer's or someone with controls. Um, now, based on, um, on this approach, um, approach solely, uh, they achieve accuracy of 0.91, which is, um, which, is, um, which, is, which is really, really well, also, also considering that they are, they're not explicitly telling what the model should be learning. We're just saying, here's data, figure out what are the patterns that are actually predicted. And if you go in and we probe the models and we see, okay, what are actually the things that it learns to pay attention to, it's, it's really quite interesting. So in the bottom is shown what's called um, heat, um, and, uh, sorry, what's called salience heat maps that um, you get them by taking the, um, uh, the gradient of the final scores uh, with regards to the word embeddings of the, of the particular input you put in. Um, so this could be the input of someone where you're predicting if they have Alzheimer's or predicting if they have control. Um, left plots show what this looks like for someone um, with Alzheimer's predicted to have Alzheimer's or someone who's control predicted to have control on the right. Um, and really interestingly, one of the things you see is that the, the word hmm and the word R ah is being, being featured more on the left-hand side compared to that it, what is on the, on the right-hand side. So, so it, it looks like at least, um, at least in part, um, this model is learning to look for, for filler words. Um, the work in Parkinson's is, is, um, has been, been similarly um, evolved. It's been largely based on what's called sustained information. So you ask someone to say, ah, uh, and then you look at what does the, what does the audio trace look like. And if you have problems with the vocal cord, there will be small, um, small, Apparencies or, or piece of variance in, in, in that input. Um, so this is comparing someone who's healthy with someone with, with more advanced Parkinson's where here I think you can actually tell the difference your, your, yourself. Um, and, and what they did in this paper by, by Little from 2019, at that time in, in Oxford, was extracting some of these, these features from audio that I showed you, so jitter, um, harmonics to noise ratio, and another type of, of acoustic measures. And based on that, they get 91.4% accuracy uh, with a simple statistical model. Um, now, this, this was a quite small data set, so, so um, it, it's not the best in terms of, of, um, of, of generalizing, but some of the really early work that was done in the field of, of Parkinson's. Some of the more exciting work has been done recently using, again, feature-free approaches where um, this particular study from, from Ian Rouge in, in Prague and colleagues um, looked at um, spoken speech, so, so uh, look at running speech, so actually spoken language rather than just the, the phonation. 
and they compared three different languages. They did this in a feature-free way where they, um, they took the, the spectrogram approach so here, encoding a, I think, an MTC spectrogram, then feeding in through a series of these convolutions that look for local information and max poolings that see if the particular uh, feature appears or not. And then again, convolutions and pooling uh, before a simple network in the end to just do the, um, the classification. Um, they, they do quite well. So if you compare accuracy in, in Spanish um, and German and Czech, you see that in, in each of the languages there is signal um, both in the, um, the baseline model and in, the, in, 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 in this um, um, uh, convolution model that they're training on, um, on, on top of it. What well, in this paper that's particularly interesting is one, they use speech rather than just to say information. But they also looked at how well can we use the things we've learned in one language to predict in a different language. So they trained the model in Spanish and they asked, okay, how well does it do in German? Or they trained in German and saw how well it did in Czech. Um, and and they, they had two interesting findings. The first one being that you can actually train a model in German and predict in Spanish, you do worse than, than training in Spanish and predicting in Spanish, but you still do fairly well. But also if you if you augment the data in when you train in Spanish with data in German, then you come better at predicting Spanish than if you only had Spanish data to train on, which is quite interesting. Um, okay, if you if you think this is interesting, if you want to try, you actually can. So, so our group have open sourced the industry leading audio and linguistic analysis libraries for clinical applications. They're called Surfboard. This is an audio analysis library. It's a bit similar to OpenSmile, if some of you are familiar with it, um, but it also has a long list of clinically relevant features and is really built for modern machine learning. And so you can run parallel processes, it works as Python packages and so on. It, it's quite fun to play around with. Um, and the system package blah blah is for linguistic analysis, having an ultimate way of extracting language patterns in, um, in 66 different languages consistently. It's also quite, quite, a, quite a breakthrough. We recently published papers outlining um, the features that we have in, in, these, in these libraries and how they change in all of these different cognitive motor and affective conditions. Um, so yeah, if you're interested, go to our GitHub. Um, it's open source. Um, we're very happy to, to, um, to give feedback, hear what you think, and contribute if you're interested. Great. I, I, I want to shift gears a bit and, uh, and sort of get to, 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 to the, main, the, main, the main point of the story, um, which is that um, there's been reports of a novel coronavirus. Um, and there's no need to worry. It is the existing one. It's COVID-19. It's not yet another one that, 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 that's come out. Um, but but the, um, the novel coronavirus, COVID-19, was, uh, was reported first in the beginning of January this year, as you all, all know. I think one thing that at a very practical level speaks to the impact it's been having all over the globe is that we're all sitting having this presentation meeting on, um, on Zoom rather than being in the, in the beautiful surroundings of, of uh, pharmacology. Um, but there's also been a bigger human and medical toll of this. So I just looked up um, um, WHO's most recent numbers this morning and we've now reached more than um, 8 million cases and more than 440,000 deaths globally. Uh, and just in the UK, it's looking pretty dire. We're, we're reaching 300,000 and about 10% of the total and death globally at, at more than 40,000. Um, now, when, when COVID happened and, and, and it's still, still the case, one of the, of the big um, strategies that, that, that became clear was that you needed to, to track and trace, identify who um, have, have, the, have the condition um, who they've been in contact with, so you can isolate people to, to stop the spread, and that's, again, why we're all sitting, sitting at, at, um, at home. Um, but one of the problems has been lack of, um, of proper tests, as, as, as you might have, have seen in the news. So, so existing tests have had fundamental limitations being generally fairly expensive, at least if you want to screen everyone in, in, in the country, um, had limited availability, um, it relatively slow, taking between days and, and hours to, to conduct, uh, and finally requiring in-person visits. So you have to have someone that you suspect have the, the disease go through London or Newcastle or, or, um, or, or wherever they're, they're living, um, 
risk infecting other people in the way and also risk infecting uh, healthcare personnel when they, when they get there. Uh, and really what, 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 what we saw when we looked at this was that we need a cheap, fast and remote test for, um, for COVID-19. Um, interestingly, there is unique cough patterns that have been identified in many different respiratory conditions. I'm listing some of them on this slide. So the common cold, asthma, wet versus dry cough, influenza, different pneumonias and, and whooping cough. Um, and and the, the scientific rationale is, is here that these, these different conditions affect the respiratory system and the articulators in different ways. And that then affects the, the way you're producing speech in a unique way that you can pick up in the, in the cough. If you want to read all the papers, scientific rationale, it's all in this link on our COVID-19 page, we have, have a lot of, a lot of, um, of papers from, from the literature lined up there. Um, okay, so we know that, that if you have a unique impact on lungs and the spiritual system, you get a unique character on the, on the cough. What we, um, one example of this is, is uh, on this slide, it's a recent paper from um, Sign at, at, at um, Amherst. Uh, it's called FluSense, we've heard about that in, in the news where they, uh, they're similar to people uh, who are coughing or not coughing, did a spectrogram encoding, then again convolutions, um, max pooling layers, and finally predicted whether they were likely to have a, um, a cough or not. Um, and, and what they found was that they can, with relatively um, uh, good certainty, um, predict if someone is, um, is coughing or if they're, if they're not coughing. Um, now, we also know that COVID-19 infection um, affects the lungs with a unique pattern. And some of this comes from, from CT scans, some of it comes from X-ray images. Um, these patterns include having a more of a peripheral um, profile. Uh, you have a thickening of the pleura around the lungs. And you're also less likely to have distribution that's both in the, in the, in the center and the, in the periphery of, of the lungs. And taking these different measures together, you can get a sense of um, or, or you can actually quite, quite well predict whether someone has, um, has COVID-19 or another pneumonia. Uh, this has been used for classifying um, patient based on CT scans and X-ray images using different machine learning algorithms. Uh, I'm assuming this in a bit more, um, bit more size here. I hope that you can, uh, you can tell there's, there's difference in how uh, the lungs are affected here versus in the influenza case. Um, compared to the healthy control, um, though I appreciate this is only an anecdotal picture, but but it does it does expand in in or generalized to other cases. Um, there's already been some some um, some really promising pre preliminary work in uh, predicting COVID from uh, from speech from coughs. Uh, the first work that came out I think was the the EIF COVID project by a group in uh, mid Middle Europe. Uh, they looked at um, a number of cough sounds from bronchitis. Uh, whooping cough, COVID-19, and, um, and health controls. And um, you should note that these are the number of cough sounds that they're using, not necessarily the number of patients. So the sample size is extremely limiting, uh, but it's still a really interesting, um, interesting study and, and, and the first one that, that really came, came out. Um, you, you know the drill, uh, mill spectrogram, encoding, max pooling, convolutions, arbitrary number of times it sometimes seems and then feeding into a simple network for getting the final output. And for the bit more sort of um, tick, tick, um, um, or machine learning safety, this is just showing the TSNE of, um, of, the, of the embedding space with the, with the different, um, different samples. Um, so, so this is a way of doing a low dimensional visualization of the, the whole space of features that you are, um, um, that, that you are basing the um, classification on. And you see how the model is learning to separate out this area as one certain kind versus this one, versus this one, versus the, the purple area. Um, in terms of accuracy, they do really well. If this were to become a diagnostic tool, that's the sort of accuracy that we'd be hoping to get. Uh, what, what is a bit worrying is that the, the size of the sample um, likely means that this is, is, um, is not something that will generalize at least um, with as good as an, an, an accuracy um, and there might be an, an particular overfitting to the, um, to the conditions. Uh, for instance, if the, if the COVID uh, or the cough, um, um, cough recordings from, from, from patients were collected in a hospital and the normal ones were collected at the home, you might just learn what a hospital sounds like. The other really interesting work that was out just a couple of weeks ago is from a group in Cambridge that's been running the, um, 
the, um, I think it's called the COVID voice app. Uh, so they looked at a number of different features in uh, people uh, with and without COVID from a crowdsourced database. This is all self-reported data. Um, in terms of area under the curve and how well they do for predictions, they are significantly below the, the prior study, uh, but it's also addressing different data. This is all something that's been collected uh, remotely versus this was uh, collected with a proper microphone in, in a hospital. And um, now for, for both of these studies and for ongoing um, so data collection work that's out there, and there's really been, been a common problem, which is we, we need much more data. Uh, we need to have, um, have both a scale of data that allows us to be certain that the predictions we're making um, applies not only in the data set that we, we've um, sort of put in a single hospital, but applies more broadly. Um, and we also want to make sure that the data that we, are, that we are training on, at least the subset of it, we're fairly sure if someone had the condition or not. So for instance, in this study, if you're just asking people if they have not, uh, there, there will be a certain uh, we have noise that's being introduced versus if you actually had a confirmed, um, a confirmed test in someone. Um, so, so we really need to be sure that we can, we can generalize and we need to have better labels on. And that is one of the, of, of the key reasons that we launched the, the Donate Your Cup campaign. And, and what the Donate Your Cup campaign does is it's collecting a very large database of cup for a, um, a global research database that will be available to academic researchers um, globally. Uh, there's three things that we're looking to get right. We're looking to get make sure that there's there's signal. Uh, we think we have a pretty good rationale for why there's there's signal. Some of those things I've walked you through uh, through, through today. Um, we want to make sure that we have proper labels on, so that we know how well um, we, we that, that we are certain whether someone has um, has the thing that we think they have, whether they have positive tested COVID, negative tested COVID, or a different spiritual condition. Um, we also want specifically to make sure that we not only have COVID patients and healthy controls, because then you might just learn to pick up on a cough rather than picking up on what specific characteristic of a cough distinguishes uh, that type of, of um, say pneumonia from, um, um, from other common types of pneumonias. And finally, we need science. To be able to work with some of these more expressive, flexible architectures like the P2P models we've been showing, and to be able to generalize across the whole population. And we need to make sure that we have a very large sample size. So the goal of the campaign that we are currently pushing for is to get in the hundreds of thousands of recordings with a subset of strongly labeled data that also includes other respiratory conditions. The goal of, of, of all of this is to develop an, an algorithm and a test that will enable us to screen everyone in the, um, in the UK, everyone globally, um, on the same day if if, um, if that would be, be um, sort of wished from, from healthcare systems um, in, 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 a, in a free, remote, non-intrusive intrusive way. This will cause some, um, some ethical considerations, some societal considerations that have to be taken into account as if, uh, when are we able to do this, would you want to screen everyone on the same day? Maybe you don't because that would put a huge load on the, on the healthcare system on the same day. You might want to spread it down. Or at least having the theoretical opportunity of being able to do that type of, of screening, and then working with healthcare authorities to figure out what's the best way of, um, of then having, having that integrated into the existing pathways. Um, we are extremely grateful, humble, excited to have some amazing people around us in the, in the volunteer team, Donor for Cough um, team. Um, we are being accelerating the campaign by, um, by this curve jumping, exponential, fabulous, fantastic volunteer team. And we are super excited about, um, about the work. This map outlines the different locations where we are currently have set up our task forces. And um, the way that we're approaching this is having local task forces set up on a city level and the people sort of in those task forces um, or in the community setting up new um, new, new chapters to be able to um, to really grow this data collection in an exponential way. And the hope is that in not too many weeks, it will look like, it will look like this. So for that reason, I, I want you to get involved and everyone can help with whatever little that they can, they can do. Um, I hope that at least you will take up on the, on the small ask and bug down your friends until they get super annoyed, uh, but finally agree to learn a cough and, and, and get their friends to do the same. Uh, and if you're interested, we'd be so excited to see you join the, um, the volunteer team. 
again, uh, send, send me a message, uh, email outreach at donateyourcock.com, um, or, um, or just get in touch with the organizer. They'll be able to, to facilitate the, the connection. And with that, I'm, I'm very happy to open this up to be more of a, of, of a conversation, um, to take any, any questions, thoughts, input, um, and, and then just, just take, it, take it from there. Thanks for, thanks for, for, for your time. Thank you, Amin. This was a great presentation and very interesting. Uh, I think we should take some questions now because we have a stream of questions coming up. I can share the screen with um, questions. Uh, okay. Okay. So let's have a look. Can you see them? Yes, I can. Yes. Okay, let's uh, address maybe the first one. How do you know for certain the cough donor is COVID positive or negative? Well, yeah. Yeah. So, so the um, let, let, let me begin right by telling how, how the data collection actually actually works for um, the people who are um, who are not not familiar. Um, maybe can I can I share my screen quickly? Then I'll just oh yes. I'll just show show what it looks like. Okay, so, so this is the web page I mentioned where you can go if you're interested in, in reading a bit more about the, the project, the problem, and particularly the, the scientific rationale behind why this is, this is possible, build a nice reference list. Um, what the survey actually looks like is um, it's like, like this, there's a, a, an information sheet um, and we collect um, informed consent from everyone who, who participates. Um, and there then be a um, a series of, of questions that you ask and that you answer about demographics and other things that relate to the risk of having um, of us predicting that you have COVID. So, for instance, your other respiratory conditions, if you're a smoker, and so on. We want to to be sure that we know it. And then finally, you come to the piece where you are recording a couple of breathings, a couple of coughs, and then a sustained phonation where you just go ah or e or o. Um, now, the, the reason that I just brought up quickly uh, for the question is when we do this collection online, we actually don't know for certain whether someone who is positive negative is positive or negative. The way that we are, that we are probing around it is to ask whether they've had a test done um, and um, the results of the test and when the test was actually conducted, um, which by going a bit deeper into the little details of the question, we get a better idea of, of if, if it's actually the case, but we don't know for sure. And uh, so what we're also in the process of doing now is, is reaching out to and working with, uh, with, with clinicians directly where we can do this in, in, in a clinical context um, to have more strongly confirmed label, again, on this, on this smaller subset of the, um, of the data, uh, and then being able to, as you've saw, seen from some of the um, of, of where I showed you, train on, on, on the larger data set where you have a bit of, of weaker labels, then being able to uh, fine tune and, uh, and importantly validate and confirm the results on the data set that have stronger labels on. Uh, that's, the, that's the approach that we've taken. But it, it, it's a really good question. It's one of the, the key problems that needs to be, to be solved. Yes. It's nice that you showed how the recording works, but I think it's, more, it's clearer once you donate your cost so everyone is encouraged to donate their mm -hmm. cost. Yes. And um, another question that is coming up. How do you know that the changes in language, so like for example in Alzheimer, are not due to them aging? Mm. Mm. Yeah, so for Iris Murdoch, you wouldn't be able to tell just based on, um, on, on that paper. That's more an interesting anecdotal um, anecdotal study. In terms of the of the Quito study, um, Looking at the, at the preclinical people, that's a comparison of um, of age match cohorts that either um, have the um, have the genetic dispositions with the APOE genotype or who who hasn't um, hasn't got it. Um, so so there you can look at a static point between two comparable age groups and you do see see the difference. There's been a number of 
um, of, of other studies that I can show, looking at, for instance, um, exam essays written by medical students uh, who later went on to develop um, Alzheimer's, or looking at the, um, the speeches or the writings of other um, authors, public figures that have generally confirmed the same, the same type of, um, of, of findings. Um, but it's important to know that these are mostly anecdotal studies, right? So the non-study and the one with medical exam essays um, all have fairly small sample sizes. And one of the things that we are working on addressing in, uh, in our team is running studies at a scale where we can be confident in the, uh, in the clinical validation that we're getting. And that's what you need to get um, to get something to the point where you can use it as a, as a medical tool. Thank you. Uh, I think the next question comes up a lot. So what about asymptomatic carriers of COVID? They, they don't have a cough, yeah, probably. Yeah, so, so there, there, there's three different degrees to that. Um, you can talk about people who have the, um, have, have the pneumonia that's often caused, by, caused, it's often caused by, by COVID, where it's fairly obvious that they have a, um, have a cough and affecting the respiratory system. The group before that is where you just have a sort of milder impact or, or an infection in the respiratory system, more on the upper, um, upper part of it. Uh, and then there's the purely asymptomatic carriers either because they're not um, one of the people who develop the cough symptoms, it's not everyone with COVID who, who does that, or they're at, at still at an asymptomatic stage. So that's, that's the, the progression of, um, of patients. Um, in terms of rationale, I think that we, we, are, we are more confident in the once you have the pneumonia that you can, you can tell these differences. Whether we can in the middle group is uncertain. Um, there, there hasn't been data out on, on, on that yet. Um, in terms of purely asymptomatic with no impact on the respiratory system, I, I don't think that, that we'd be able to, to pick it up. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, okay, the next question is about, yes, if someone has an underlying lung condition or other disease, in addition to COVID, then does the cough partner stay unique to COVID? Hmm. <laughs> it's an interesting question. Yeah, this, this, it, it's a really interesting mm, one. Mm. I, I'd, I'd say we, we don't know. Mm. The, um, the closest comparison I have to that is that if you look in someone with, uh, with Parkinson's, um, you often have comorbidities, which means that you, you not only have Parkinson's, there's also other things that go wrong. So about 80% of people with Parkinson's eventually develop dementia and a large fraction of them develop depression. And you can go into some degree in someone with Parkinson's and quantify both the motor symptoms to tell they have this degree of, of motor impairment or, or Parkinsonianism, but also in them use, use language to get a readout on the, on the cognitive component. So, so in that way, there's, there's, there's unique patterns. But that's also further away from each other on this staircase of different things that we're analyzing. So, so whether that, that also applies similarly when we get, uh, when we get further down is, is an unknown for me. Mm. Okay, so do you predict it's gonna test positive if you have another uh, cough, another lung condition? So, so, so I, I, I think this mm -hmm. one asks, say you had someone with, um, with influenza and, you, and that person then also got infected yeah. with, uh, and seen, would, would, would that combination of infections be something that would still be able to be picked up as COVID, given that the, the, the variance in the noise of the influenza was there, um, which is something that, that we don't, um, I, that is something that we don't know, but we're collecting the tab of data that will hopefully enable us to, to find out. Okay, so hopefully it's in, not soon, we've all the recording. <laughs> oh, this is more about the volunteer team. So what job? Does the volunteer team do? Yes. Oh, so yeah. we, 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 have, we have two different types of, of volunteer teams. We have, uh, we have city teams and we have functional teams. Now, the city teams are the ones that are, um, that are dedicated to a particular geography, and they work in um, getting as many people um, to donate a cough with as, as high quality data as possible. So of course, if you can get people with positively from COVID, it's better than just healthy controls, but healthy controls are also good to have. Um, I'll get a bit back to what the practical work is there, but just so with the functional team, they work across the different, um, different city teams to 
um, to leverage up the work and accelerate the work that they're doing. So this can be helping with marketing collateral or there's a central social media team and, and, and so on. That works more as a cross function and across different, different city teams. The city teams work on reach out, so figuring out who to reach out to, and clever strategies, campaigns, and so just every, every um, scrappy, ingenious way we can find to get the, the, word, um, the word out there. Just want to add that I'm also a volunteer with these projects, and it's really fun, and they're a great team. So I encourage people to join as volunteers too. Yeah, I mean, if, if you have something, something to add, feel 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 free to um, to input. Yes, for example, I'm from Italy, and I'm trying to start a task force there. So I think it's really exciting to share it with your friends and people from the country you're from. So if from this chat, several people could start task force from the country they're from so i think that'd be also amazing <laughs> yeah okay for the next question um when studying neurodegenerative disorders can you detect disease from a voice sample at one point or do you have to track the same person over time the short answer is yes you can detect it from a single time point but there's more to it than um, than, than that one of the really interesting things about language is that it's in general a quite stable process. So if you think about yourself as you age, um, if you're just going to stay healthy, eventually you're going to, to become weaker and you're going to be like frail and walk slow and so on. But you'll be able to speak for almost the, or, 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 or for, for most people until the day that you die. So it's a quite stable thing over time. That means that you have a really good background population when you're comparing someone where there is a problem with the speech, for instance, when you're developing um, Alzheimer's disease. Now, depending on what condition that you are looking at, this, um, this is more or less true. So for Alzheimer's, where it's about the language, that matters. Um, the the, the one-time point is, is, is absolutely fine. If you wanted to look at someone with an affective condition, such as depression, um, where it's a more transient, um, transient um, condition and you can have on and off and um, sort of sort of remission and, and, and then you can, you can have relapses. Having longitudinal data is very helpful for being able to predict the, those, those cycles. So it all depends. If you have longitudinal data, it's better, but for many conditions you can do it from just a single time point. Okay, great. Um, mm. Can I keep going? Sorry, I'm just shooting a few questions. Is it okay? Yeah, please. Yeah. Please. <laughs> So is there a difference between a forced cough for, for the donation versus a real cough? I, my, my gut feeling would tell me, yes, but we still need mm. more data on it. Um, so so it, this is actually one of the things that we are asking of people in the survey. So, so it, it's, it's really brilliantly picked up. Um, if you look at, at, the, um, at the preliminary data that came out of, of Cambridge, where they're comparing COVID with, with healthy, one of the most significant feature changes they see is in the duration of the cough, which could tell something about when you are forcing a cough in someone who's healthy. It just, it's much shorter than it is in, um, in someone where there's an, a, a real cough. Whether well, it's different between a forced cough and a real cough in, in COVID or asthma, et cetera, um, that's a more... Um, I think that's a more nuanced question. Thank you. Um, okay, next question is, how sensitive is your approach compared to classical non-invasive diagnostic tools? Oh, sorry, well, that's off in any way. Self-reported headache, coughing, temperature check. Hmm. Hmm. Yeah, so, so there was a, a, a recent paper out that I'm happy to have to share with, uh, with, the, with the person if, if they're interested. Um, looking at these self-reported symptoms where one of the, so, so the fact that I was loading by far the highest, also more than people were coughing, was loss of smell. And that for, with, with, with very, very high um, degree of, of certainty, sort of relatively could tell whether someone um, had, had COVID or didn't, or at least whether they had a lung condition or didn't. And at that time, if you have a lung condition, it was very likely to be, to be COVID. Uh, we, we don't have data out yet at a scale where we're comfortable about the, um, the robustness and the accuracy of the results so that we'd be able to, um, able to, to compare. So, so that's, that's still, still an unknown, but, but it's a good question. Mm. 
thank you. Uh, next question. Oh, we've been through this question with the volunteers a lot. How much does the quality of the audio recording affect the ability to detect COVID? Hmm. Yeah, the quality is more an, an, an issue um, with, the, with the audio than it is with the language as you sort of move down the, the hierarchy of, of, of using, using speech. We've actually been able to work in Alzheimer's on quite poor quality recordings, uh, just analyzing the, the language with, with, with good results. Uh, it does matter in, in COVID, uh, both in terms of, of the, uh, the effect of quality, but also other things that, um, that can confound the prediction that, that, that these models are doing. So I, I talked a bit about when you're analyzing the audio that you want to essentially go from, from the, the pure audio trace to either feature vector or spectrogram because it's more low dimensional and that enables you to, um, to mitigate some of the, of the noise and the variance that you get from just having inherently bad noisy um, data. Um, and, and we know, for instance, in, um, if, you, if you don't do this and you try to do predictions in, in ALS, then the, the room that the person is in ends up mattering more than whether they have the condition or not. Um, so the, so the, quality, the quality definitely, definitely matter. And the, um, the question then becomes, how do, you, how do you quantify the quality and set appropriate um, metrics for, um, for what criteria that, that, uh, that cough that already needs to meet to um, for us to be sure that the algorithm works appropriately. And, and, and that, that is how we work with, with medical ML in general. We have to quantify what are the conditions that need to be in place for us to have a certain efficacy with a certain um, um, robustness or, or certainty. Okay, thanks. Uh, why have you chosen to analyze COPS rather than speech to diagnose COVID? The next question. Yeah, that does, it was mostly based on the, um, on, on the prior art in other respiratory conditions that have largely been dealing with, with coughs or breathings or sustained pronations. And when you, um, yeah, there, there's, there's a trade-off in how um, constrained the speech task you give someone is and begins with sustained pronation, ah, then it becomes a repeating syllables like, Pataka, pataka, pataka. Then you ask someone to read a text, and, and, and you get acoustic information, but not the linguistic. And then you ask them questions, or, do, or describe the picture, and and, and so on. Um, and I guess the, the the more constrained you are on the speech task, the easier it is to analyze the acoustic patterns. But the less um, theoretic information there is, whereas the the more open-ended the task becomes, the more theoretic information you can you can take, but the tougher it becomes relatively and the more data you need, you need relatively. So, so it's largely based on, on the prior, prior art, prior literature, and then on, on these considerations around what are the patterns that you want to extract, and these are largely acoustic. Hmm. Great. Um. Hmm. Ah, Great this is about question. recruitment. Yes. So what top qualities and skills do you look for when considering a new recruit to work for Novoid? Is there any training on boarding for new employees? Nice. Yeah, so, so we, there's a couple of things that we put a, um, we put a very high um, emphasis on. And the first one is we, we want everyone on the team to have a very strong motivation of why they're there. So many people on the team now have personal connections to some of the seats that we're working in or another way of finding so deep meaning in, in the type of work that we're doing. And that's something that matters a lot to us. And um, second thing that matters a lot to, to me as, uh, as one of the, uh, of the team of the company who is, who is managing personal development and training is that we think there is a, a, a good match from the perspective, not only that, that, the, um, that, that the person um, is able to, um, to add in a statistic way to our team, but also that, that, um, that I, we can help um, take them to where they need to go long term in their professional and um, and also so to treat you as a professional but also just as a human being that's something that matters tremendously to us we want everyone to who, who works here to have a deep meaning in the work they're, they're doing and then finally we look for people who are who are good or who are excellent people who um, who can come in and um, and sort of base purely on their their merit just shows why 
um, why they're an appropriate person for, for the role or for what we didn't know the role was supposed to be. So all of our recruitment and, um, and assessment is based purely on, um, on merit. Um, and one of the, of the best people that we've, um, that we've, we've had the pleasure working with actually came from a um, from the background of urban planning, um, which was mm -hmm. very peripheral to, to, um, to, to, to what we were doing. But when he came into the pipeline the process and, 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 and we, we did the evaluation, he just turned out to be extremely talented and, and, and good at the, at the thing that we, we wanted someone to, to fulfill. Um, independence also matter. Um, Strong focus on personal development and being fun. No, I mean, so, so some, someone that, that we, that we um, someone who also um, can add to the culture of the team. I, I, I think that's what I'm, um, what, I'm, um, what I'm getting at. And people who are in general kind, good human beings. That's great to hear. <laughs> okay, so we get uh, maybe almost 15 past so a few final questions another one about working at Novoica again so would day-to-day -day work be similar to that of masters and digital research no no <laughs> no so so working working in a startup company is a very different thing from working in a um, in an academic environment and um, it is hmm, um, it's very fast paced and chaotic and, and uncertain and things can change at a very rapid pace. Um, I'd also say that people who join, at least in, in, in our team who join, get, like you, you become the PI on, on day one, you, you enter the, um, you, you enter, enter the team. Uh, we are, uh, are very flat in, in, in the way that we are, uh, that we are we're managing. Uh, we want people to come in and have initiative, so you get lots of responsibility from 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 day one, um, and then also in terms of research, we are doing research. We're actually doing some really exciting research in in um, innovating in at the frontier of, of, of both the um, uh, the deep audio and, and NLP space that, that that hopefully we'll be able to share with you in in, in a couple of um, a couple of weeks. Um, so so we, we do, do do cutting edge research like you do if you were in one of the groups here in Oxford, Cambridge, Stanford, where, where, wherever. Um, but it's it's done within the context of building the um, the first widely adopted speech biomarker for healthcare, which means that we have certain things that drives how both the things that we do, but also how we do them, because we want to make sure that the things we do build towards the, the end goal where we are um, where we're going. And so it, it's quite it's quite a different experience, but I say for me, someone who's been in academia for most of my professional career, uh, it's 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 a lot of fun, uh, and it's a lot of, of meaning as well. Great. Okay, let's have a final question on the same topic. If you someone is asking if you're looking for undergraduate intern, <laughs> <laughs> if if you fit the uh, the uh, the rambling description that I, I gave, a <laughs> yeah, looking for you. Um, please please um, go to. Uh, to our career page and, and, and send, send in an, an application. Uh, we're very happy to, to go from you. Okay. Okay, we have only two questions left. Should we go for them? And yes, let's, let's do a, um, a wrap and then let's let everyone have their, um, have their evening. Yes, probably. So let's maybe just have a tiny one. So have you found that there is changes in COVID-19 coughing patterns at different stages of the disease? Uh, if they vary across the timeline or if they're consistent, oh well, we kind of we kind of responded to this one already. But if you have something else to add, yeah, I'm I'm not I'm not quite sure if I understand the second question. But but I I what I read as is whether this can be done on device or if it has mm -hmm. to be be sent um, to be sent somewhere. And um, oh yeah, second. Yeah. It's easy. I'd, I'd certainly imagine that this can be, be done on device with some, some sort of, sort of light, lightweight with model. Uh, I think once you have the, the feature extraction of the embedding and done for, for the, the audio, it's, it's not very heavy lifting to do the actual, um, the actual classification. And then you move the other question, which was on change over, um, over yeah. time. Um, it's not something that we have data out on, um, on yet, um, but if you... Um, if you 
if you imagine how the COP is actually developing and sort of becoming more like the Christie Wuhan COP and, 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 and sort of come just louder and, and, and longer, I'd imagine that you can see changes over time in, in progression, at least with fine grain enough, enough data. Um, certainly that is the, um, that's the case with some of the other conditions that we've been in. Okay. Well, I think it's our time. Thank you very much for your talk and the time you took to share this information with us. And we look forward to see all the members also next week because we have another talk. And yes, that is all from us. Thank you, Emil, again, and thank you for everyone who joined. Yeah, thank you so much for, for having me, everyone, and for all of the questions. Um, and yes. final thing is we, we should remember the Zoom chat because I, I promised that we'd pick a winner out of the- Oh, sorry, uh, yes. All the ones. I'll just go, go through and quickly, quickly screenshot show this before you shut down the call and then we'll um, okay. We'll, we'll contact the winner.